I remember too, it was, it was uh, smushed in, so now it's like a grade eight dance for everyone <laughs> <laughs> uh, So I, I did just talk uh, at B side about copyright and notice and notice provisions. Today, what I want to do is I want to give you a, a very general crash type course in intellectual property. And please don't roll your eyes; it's not going to be too simple. I'm going to try and, and add some value to it. Um, so it'll be something a little bit beyond what you've probably gotten on the uh, Industry Canada website. So what is intellectual property? I want to talk about it by talking about Lego, because Lego is the best way to talk about anything, in my opinion. Uh, and not just because it has a fancy little registered trademark symbol there. Uh, but we'll use Lego today to talk about it just to frame the discussion. So, these, each of these four mini figures represents uh, an area of intellectual property law. Uh, so we have the artist or copyright trademark is my, my little advertising executive. Uh, we have the scientist uh, for patent, and we have the little frantic chef for trade secret. Now, what these four have in common is that they all represent different ways of protecting different types of ideas. So they all turn an idea into property, into an asset um, that, that you have by creating exclusivity. That's what all of these types have in common, all of these types of intellectual property have in common. They create that exclusivity, which means that you have proprietary interest in whatever the idea or expression of that idea is. So let's start with copyright. So how does copyright work? So here's our little artist. Uh, he makes a painting. He calls it Two Cats Playing with Jam and Cilantro. That's, that's just what it looks like to me. I don't know if it's a pink flat test or what. Um, but so by using his skill and judgment to create the painting, he has created the work and he has an interest in that work. Now under the Copyright Act, he has that exclusive interest in the work to, uh, to sell, license, copy that work for 50 for his lifetime plus 50 years. And that's a pretty long time, given that it's an exclusive right to stop anybody else. So when the artist has an idea, he has this idea of two cats playing with jam at cilantro. <laughs> um, but the idea is not what's actually protected. It's the expression of the idea that's protected. So it's not this, because this is quite obviously not a painting. Uh, it's, it's the painting itself that's protected, uh, not, not the idea for the painting. I don't know why I got that up there. Uh, so the painting is called Two Cats <laughs> Playing with Jam and Cilantro. That's what's protected, not the idea. Now, to give you a real world example of this, there was actually a lawsuit uh, by an author. And I ha have people seen this movie, slash read these, this book, these books? Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert so anyone who hasn't done any of those things, you should plug your ears. Um, the, the main premise of these, these books is that Jesus had a child. Now this lawsuit was, was brought by an author who sued Dan Brown uh, for copyright infringement, claiming that Dan Brown had stolen his idea of Jesus having a child and that this was copyright infringement. Now the courts obviously held that it wasn't copyright infringement because it was an idea and not the expression of the idea. So that's, that puts it into the real world for you. So copyright isn't just for writers or artists, musicians, it's not just for those types. Uh, copyright is also about protecting, it can cover things like computer programs as well, so source code. So I've actually put source code inside of uh, licensing agreements, partnership agreements, where it's listed as, as an intellectual property asset. It is property, of course. And as soon as it's written, it has that protection. And computer programs are also, they also present an interesting issue uh, because they're often copied as part of their use. And now the Copyright Act deals with computer programs by giving the creator of the computer program the exclusive right, this is a special right to rent uh, out the computer program. So this means that the user of the, of the copyright program can copy the program as long as they do so pursuant to the terms of use, which is actually more like a rental agreement than anything else. So they can only copy it for very specific purposes. Now I know I know this is a new Lego guy and that he wasn't in our 
our, our slide of Lego guys, but this industrial design is related to copyright because it kind of swoops in where copyright can't really apply, but only in the context of mass produced items. So uh, decorative patterns on fabric or on glassware, kind of like this guy, uh, are protected by, uh, by our industrial design. Now this is the cornflower pattern. This is probably the single most Cape Breton item I have. Everyone's grandmother, I'm sure, has one of these, or mother has one, because I know my mother-in-law has one. Actually, I think she has six, anyway, uh, just in case one breaks. So industrial design will protect this little thing here because it's being registered under the under that act, under the act that protects it. Um, now the term is shorter, so it's not as good as copyright, but it's certainly better than nothing because it gives you a way to protect your design. What is the term? Pardon me? What is the term for copyright and for industrial design? This is just, it's just an industrial design. Well, what's the term? You said the term, term? Is shorter, term is shorter. No. Oh, sorry, sorry, the length of time. I don't actually, I can't top of my head right now, uh, but it, it's significantly shorter than copyright. I think it's, I think it's very similar to patent actually. I think it's about 20 years. That's a very good question. Uh, now, color, so the interesting thing about industrial design is you can protect the design, but the color itself isn't protected under the industrial design. It's protected underneath uh, trademark if you're actually using that color, that particular color, uh, with your mark. So there are certainly gaps there. So speaking of, of trademark, um, trademark doesn't protect the product itself. It doesn't do that. It protects the association between the mark on the product and the product with the maker of the mark. So it's the connection between the product, the mark on the product, and the mind of the consumer that's important. And the goal of trademark is to prevent confusion between, uh, within the consumer between that mark and another product that's not produced by the owner of the mark. That all sounds kind of confusing. Um, but basically, you can have a mark that is a word. So the word Lego can be trademarked. And you can also have it be an image, which is the actual logo itself. So you can register both of these. You can register both the name and the logo. And often people register both. Now, another goal of the copy of, of trademark rather is to prevent free riding. Now, free riding is basically where a brand has worked for years and years and years to create a positive association with their name, with their logo, uh, they have good business practices, they're nice to their employees, and there's all sorts of warm, fuzzy feelings uh, associated with their brand and their mark associated with the brand. And then in comes another company and they use their logo with all of this happy baggage, I guess I'll call it, happy baggage associated with it and they attempt to use their logo to cash in on some of that brand equity. And that's a problem, and it's a problem that the Trademark Act tries to prevent by preventing free riding. The prime example of free riding, I've got my Pink Panther up here, is that is where there was a beauty salon, uh, I think somewhere in California, it was called the Pink Panther Beauty Salon. And it was, this, this place was tacky, it's all get out. Pink walls, pink panther everywhere, plush cushions. It, it actually was a pink panther themed floor to ceiling. Now they were sued by the United Artists because they were you they were free riding on their mark on the Pink Panther brand, and they were cashing in on the brand equity of Pink Panther uh, to promote their salon. And United Artists actually won because they were indeed using the mark. Not, it wasn't just about the colors, it was about them using the actual Pink Panther itself in their salon to free ride on top of that mark and use their brand equity. So that's what it prevents. So trademark prevention protection also prevents, uh, it extends rather, the protection extends, the use of domain names. So when you sign up for a domain name and you register a domain name, what you, what you don't realize is that a lot of the time in the user agreements, you're promising that you're not registering a domain name that's similar to someone else's <coughs> trademark. So it's not just in the Trademark Act that we find protection. It's also in individual user agreements where you promise that, to the best of your knowledge, which is a magic phrase, uh, that you're not using someone else's trademark or registering a domain that's very similar to someone else's trademark. Now, speaking of registration, do you have to register your trademark? 
Now the answer to that is no. There is such thing as an unregistered trademark. Um, but the problem is, is that if you think that someone is infringing your trademark, you think they're using your mark, uh, if, you, if it's unregistered, what you have to do is you have to go through a few more hoops in order to prove that it's yours. So you have to prove that you've used it. Then you have to prove that uh, you've used it in a, geograph in a particular geographical area and that you've created an association between your brand, your company, and, that, and the mark that you think someone else has taken. You have to prove that association. Often this requires uh, very expensive survey evidence. Uh, you have to make all sorts of arguments in front of a judge. And you also have to prove that people were actually confused by the use of the mark. Now, if you register your trademark, uh, you automatically establish that you've used it, that it's your mark. On the date of registration, that's when you started using it. So it's easy that way, it create, removes that hurdle. You also have national protection. So rather than having to prove a particular geographical area where you use the mark, you expand outwards to be all of Canada, which is very helpful. And like I said, your protection begins from the date of registration. Now, registration has limits. It doesn't mean that your trademark is valid because what happens is, is that a trademark officer will, when the application comes in, they'll take a really cursory look. They'll do a quick search of the database. They're not actually saying that your trademark is valid. They're just saying that it doesn't quite, it doesn't obviously uh, infringe somebody else's trademark. So there are limits to registration. And of course, in order to be registered, it has to be distinctive. So it can't, uh, it can't be uh, from multiple sources. It has to be one source, one where connected to that mark. Now, this is an actual case. This is an actual case that happened. It, it wasn't called this. It actually it was their holding company names, but I like to call it Lego versus Mega Blocks. And I'm not going to say anything about the quality of the plastic used in the bricks because I know there are probably some very serious Lego people here. Um, but this actually did happen. It was it was a trademark case. It wasn't necessarily a patent case. So what happened was Lego's patent on its eight. What are we calling those things? I'm, I'm going to call them nubbin, eight dot block, which is a tongue twister. Uh, that patent expired. And Lego was desperately scrambling to either make the block a little bit different to get a new patent or to, or to enforce, uh, enforce their intellectual property in some other way. So they decided that they were going to try and do it through trademark. So Lego basically argued that, look, these blocks have been around for so long, so long that people associate the physical block and how they use the block itself with our brand, with our company. And so they said that it was actually trademark. It was protected by trademark. Now, unfortunately, this argument didn't fly. I know it sounds like a bit of a stretch, but lawyers can be very convincing. Uh, so the argument didn't fly. It didn't fly because you can't trademark the functionality of something. That's not what trademark does. That's what patent does. So patent protection gives the holder the exclusive right you know, to make, construct, use, or sell an item, a work, an innovation for 20 years. Now that's not as long as copyright, but what this is, is it's an absolute monopoly. And that's the, that's the advantage of patent. That's why you go through the extremely expensive process of registering a patent, and you do have to register in order to get a patent. This isn't something that's automatic. Now, unlike playing with Lego, this uh, this game cost so many fights in my house when I was growing up. Lego was like the peaceful toy. This was war, man. Um, so the monopoly is the advantage. Now. And this, the whole idea behind intellectual property is this, is this idea of balancing, right? You're balancing between how do we ensure that people have the incentives to create these things while still making sure that these ideas get spread around. That's, this is the philosophical balance that we're trying to strike in all forms of intellectual property. So the more you restrict something, the longer you protect something, the longer you give that monopoly, uh, the, less thing, the less ideas get spread around. So it really is all a balancing exercise. So 
is something patentable? This is this is the difficult question, and this is why usually lawyers usually get involved with patents uh, because there, there are some difficult questions that we have to answer. So, in order to patent something, it has to have utility. It has to be useful at the time that you file the patent. Now, generally, this involves questions of benefit to society, um, but and it's generally a pretty easy hurdle to get over. Not to trivialize it too much for those of you who have patents in the room, I'm sure that it was a very difficult process. Um, but the thing also has to be novel. The idea has to be novel. Um, so how difficult was the idea to come up with? If it wasn't difficult, then it's not patentable. And again, that's not a huge hurdle to get over. Now, this is another, this is kind of a more difficult one to get over. Uh, it has to be a non-obvious thing. So there has to be that inventive step. So this is where, this is, you've heard, you've heard me use the term innovation. This is where if it's not an innovation, then it can't be patented. So it has to be something new. It has to be um, something somewhat unique. Uh, you can have a patent for building on other products, so a new use for an old product, but generally it has to be pretty unique. And commercial success isn't the only factor in that. There are lots of factors that the courts consider. Then you have to ask, is this subject is this subject matter that can actually be patented? And there's a whole long laundry list of things that can't be patented. Things that can, inventive concepts, that's an easy one. Um, a new use for an existing product, I already mentioned that one. And cells can actually be patented. And this was tested with the oncogenic mouse, which is a mouse that was designed, it's called the Harvard mouse. Um, it was designed to be cancerous, basically. So every mouse that is born, so a certain percentage of them will develop cancer. Um, and this is obviously for laboratory testing, sorry for those of you who are, who are animal people. Um, but you can't actually patent the mouse itself. So you can patent the cell, but not, not higher life forms like, like the mouse itself. Uh, you can't patent plants. There's a whole other scheme for varieties of plants beyond the scope of this talk. Um, and you also cannot patent business methods. Now, there are exceptions to this, uh, but again, kind of beyond the scope of this talk and a little bit more detail required here. I didn't want to bore you. Um, but I did want to put a troll on a slide. <laughs> so you're welcome. Uh, so just like the whole rest of the internet uh, world, IP has trolls too. Now trolls are people, who, people or companies, more often companies, who they make their money by acquiring patents or licenses to patents, usually by exploiting the over-eager inventor. Um, and they don't intend to actually make the thing or use the patent in any way. They just kind of hold it and they wait. Uh, they wait until someone else start, starts uh, making a product that's similar to what they have in their patent, and then they sue them. That's how they do it. Um, and they, they extort settlement money out of them and all sorts of things. So naturally, this is a huge problem. It's a huge problem for intellectual property law. It, uh, judges don't really know what to do with it. It's kind of a tough one. Uh, they're trying to deal with it, but more often than not, uh, they... They kind of they fall short on finding out who, who these trolls actually are because it's tough to distinguish between someone who legitimately has a patent and wants to protect it and between someone who is just trying to make a quick buck. So, so far, we have copyright, trademark, and patent. We have these three ways of protecting our, our product. So with, so with copyright, we protected the logo. Uh, we've protected the jingle. We've protected any expression of, of an idea associated with this, with the Heinz ketchup bottle. Um, with trademark, we've protected also the logo. We may have protected some of the colors in there. Um, and with patent, we may have protected uh, the special machine that one of our guys invented to make this ketchup. That's hypothetical. I don't think that actually happened, but that's what we've done here. So. But we haven't actually protected what's inside of the bottle. So, and that's kind of the most important part about ketchup, although people would argue it's all about the branding. But ketchup is what's inside the bottle. So we haven't actually protected that yet. And what we protect that with is trade secret. We can't use copyright, trademark, or patent to protect what's inside the bottle. We can only use trade secret. Now, trade secret 
<laughs> is tough because there's no registration scheme for trade secret. You only have a trade secret as long as you keep it secret. So it's, this is, trade secret is used for things like recipes, uh, for uh, manufacturing methods, um, things, actions, things that can't really be uh, necessarily put down to, the, to a manual. Uh, that's, that's what's protected by trade secret. Now, if something can be reverse engineered, um, there's no protection for that. So if someone gets the Heinz ketchup and they analyze it on a microscopic level and they figure it out and they make ketchup that tastes just like that, there's no protection for you. Sorry, Heinz. Uh, you've got nothing there. Now, most of the time, trade secret is binding mostly for employees. So if you have an employee and you say, Psst, come here, I'm going to share the secret family recipe for Heinz ketchup, don't share it with anybody. If the employee then walks off uh, to and, and, you know, to another ketchup factory and, and starts making the Heinz ketchup using your recipe, then you can go after them for, uh, for reaching your trade secret. Most of the time, you'll have to have someone sign a contract saying that they're going to keep it secret. So really, it's more like a non-disclosure thing. Good question. Yes, um, yeah. Heinz has a, a, they just come out with a chili sauce. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have a family recipe for my mother, right? Yes. That tastes like that, and uh, but it's better. Yes. So if I was to patent, I can't. I can't patent it. Right? Nope. So it's a trade secret. Yeah. Okay. So Heinz can't sue me if it tastes like hers. <laughs> no, they can't. But they can sue you if you put it in a bottle like that. No. Or if you call it Heinz's best or something like that, where it's confusing. <laughs> so you could put it in. A, you could put it in a bottle, your own design, with your own logo, your own marketing, your own jingle. They can't touch me. I encourage you to do so because that sauce is delicious and yours is even better. I like to taste that. Uh, so the advantage, now I know that this, this sounds really loosey-goosey and like there's no advantage to this, but there is actually a significant advantage. It's that it, to, patent requires you to disclose your invention. It requires you to disclose how it works, what it looks like, detailed schematics. Sometimes you send something off to the patent office, they say, no, not enough detail, send us more. They want more. So you have to, you have to completely disclose how, how your thing works and, uh, and, its, and its potential uses. And in doing that, you're, you're doing that trade-off where you say, okay, I'm going to take that, that, that total monopoly for this 20-year period, but you're going to be giving up that information. And for, for most people, that's plenty. For some people, it's not enough, so they'd rather keep things in the realm of trade secret because trade secret, like I said, lasts as long as you keep it secret. But a trade secret can never protect a product if somebody else figures out how to make the same ketchup. That's right. That's right. That's right. So although there are advantages, there are disadvantages. It's tough to know which one to choose. And sometimes you're limited, other times you're not. So there's my Ashley Madison one. So sorry, I had to, I had to do it. We're talking about secrets. Uh, so, and, but, the, but this is this is important because we're out of that time where before computers. I don't even know if I remember that time. I don't even know if I want to remember that time. But we're out of the time where if you if you had the recipe for Heinz ketchup and you put it in a box and you locked it up, you were pretty sure that it was going to be safe. You were pretty sure that unless somebody broke into your house, broke into the vault where the box is, broke the box open, got the recipe, realized it was the recipe, and then went out to make to make the product, you were pretty sure that you could keep making Heinz ketchup the way you've been making Heinz ketchup since the dawn of time, as far as I'm concerned. So, but the problem is, is that now everything is on computers, so it is vulnerable to security threats, uh, to being exposed. So trade secret has yet to really grapple with this and it, and it really can't because it doesn't have a legislation scheme. So really the other forms of intellectual property are becoming more and more important as trade secret becomes less and less important. That's not to say that it won't help you, but that is to say that it has its limits. So how do you protect your ideas? Here's my, this is the only wall of text slide I have. And then we're almost, we're almost done anyway. So with copyright, you don't necessarily have to register. You can register. It's up to you. Um, one positive, 
with One Pro with registering is that you establish your ownership. You make it very clear to the world that you own that thing, that you own that expression of that idea. You also establish the date that it was created. It's not difficult to prove because you've registered. It's quite clear. Uh, con of that, cost and time. That's always the con of registering. Of Similar to trademark, you don't have to register. You can. There are advantages to doing that. There are disadvantages. Disadvantages cost. Or what if something is already held? Then you can't go in and say, well, I didn't know it was, it was trademark. I didn't know. Um, and that is a potential defense. So that's problematic. Now, with patent, like I said, you have to register in order to have that protection because it is, it is that true monopoly for 20 whole years. And you can also file internationally which is very helpful as well because then your patent is enforceable around the world. So that's an advantage of, of registering. Uh, the 20-year monopoly, another advantage, like I said. The problem is, is that disclosure. You have to go through that disclosure process where you say, this is my idea world, this is my idea, here you go, this is how it works. Uh, you're bearing your soul, you're showing them your innovation. You get the 20 years, but at the same time, you give it up. Give up your secret. Trade secret, there's no registration scheme, so you don't even have to think about that. You do have an absolute monopoly as long as you have secret, as long as you keep it to yourself or a few closely close friends, I guess. Uh, but secrets are difficult to keep. So why do you care? This is the important question. Uh, the issue is, is that consumers have more choice. And often when people are coming up with products, they're not necessarily reinventing the wheel. They're maybe adding something slightly new to a new product. But the issue is, is that competition is very, very tough. And protecting your IP uh, can give you a significant advantage and furnish your company with assets. And investors find assets like registered IP very attractive because it's something that they can put on their sheet. They can say, look, they have X, Y, and Z. All right. And they can value that. So that's part of why you should care. You should also care because understanding copyright or underestimating the power of any of these things. Uh, copyright, you'd be underestimating the power of expression. Trademark, you'd be underestimating the value of your brand. Patent, you'd be underestimating the value of your innovation. And trade secret, you'd be underestimating the value of ketchup. Does anyone have any questions? I bet. Yes? If you uh, register a trademark that includes text, is registering translations individually separate? You mean English and French? Any, any language. Well, I've come across this in just English and French. I haven't, I haven't done any Spanish ones yet, but you have to register in both languages. So yeah. they are separate. But there's a process for that. I don't, I think there's a, there's a kind of break on price. I'm not 100% certain. Yes. Has there ever been a meaningful patent lawsuit in Nova Scotia? That is a very good question. I'm sure that they're happy. Most of the cases that I've looked at, because because it's a it's a federal it's a federal court, right, um, for intellectual property. Uh, so when I look at it, you'd have to look kind of deep in the facts of the case to figure out if, if the company was actually from Nova Scotia. But it's all on the federal level. Big federal judges. It would work a lot better. <laughs> I agree. Any other questions? Why is copyright so long? <laughs> what was that, sorry? Why is copyright so long? Ah, well, that's that's a very good question. Um, and I don't know. There's a mouse <laughs> in the States who lives in Florida. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's mostly, well, you're right, though, because it's mostly to do with the power of the lobby groups. And in the States, it was Walt Disney, really, who drove that. He, he basically paid a bunch of lobbyists to go and make sure that it was long enough. And then we just, Canada being Canada, we followed suit. We're like, oh, the US is doing that. We'll do that too. And, and so, there's a lack of a counterbalance argument in it too, because there's no utility. It's entertainment, generally, mm -hmm. in, in copyright. And so somebody owns the rights to Mickey Mouse. I mean, you know, so what, right? And you got utility where you'll have a drug patent or something like that, and more interest to the public to have it open after you know they, they try to balance that downwards for those reasons. So I think that's a, a big part of that. 
Mickey Mouse is important, I guess. But. <laughs> but the question always has to be, without the incentives provided by intellectual property legislation, would Mickey Mouse have been created? Maybe, maybe not. But that's that's the question that's always asked, right? It's, is is it providing just enough incentive that the create that whatever was created would have been created? Because if you don't have a reason to create something, you can create something just for your fun, just for your own love of of drawing little, little mice, um, but ultimately people need to eat, right? So they need some kind of incentive for creating these works. And I think that that's why it was so long, because if you have a patent, generally you have something with a lot of, I, I was about to say inherent value, but with a lot of um, potential to be monetized, more potential to be monetized. So you have something that can turn into a machine or, or um, or a product that people buy like that. Whereas with copyright, you have to sell so many pictures of a mouse in order to get the same amount of money that you get by selling one patented product. That's one perspective. I don't say I necessarily agree with that. Um, it's a little easier to sell like frivolous entertaining stuff than it is to sell useful stuff, isn't it? You just sell it for a different price point. That's the real issue. Any other questions? Yeah. With uh, with trademarking, uh, are, are you protected the moment you apply for it or when the process is completed? You are protected the moment you apply. So what you do is you, you send your trademark application in and then they send you this this you know sheet back basically this confirmation uh, that says that your, your application is being processed and at that point you have the protection. Okay. Same true is true with registering your copyright as well. Okay. All right. Well thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much everybody.